Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, December 13th. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council. We're going to start our day with a proclamation recognizing CCI Health Services' 50th anniversary, and the proclamation will be presented by Council Members Jawando Stewart, and I see the County Executive is here with us as well. I come on down. You're the next contestants. <laughs> the prize is a fancy proclamation. Good morning, everybody. Um, honored to be here with the county executive and council member Kate Stewart, where CCI is housed uh, to celebrate, as I was just saying to them before, just in the nick of time, their 50th anniversary, which is this year. Um, CCI Health Services. Uh, is an awesome organization. They're one of the oldest and longest serving health services in our county, in our region, um, and have really just been doing the work, keeping their head down, have not uh, been self-aggrandizing, frankly, uh, and have promoted. I visited them in 2021 and was amazed by the depth and breadth of their services, uh, interacted with their staff, with some of their clients, um, and during COVID, they really helped us out. Uh, you know, County Executive, I'm sure, will mention this. We're very proud to have the highest vaccination rate in the country for a large jurisdiction and to support folks with food and other services. CCI was right on the front lines during the pandemic delivering those services in communities that needed it the most. So it's really an honor to uh, recognize them today, uh, and you'll hear from their CEO shortly. Uh, but first, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Council Member Stewart, and then County Executive, and then we'll read the proclamation and we'll hear from our great CEO. Councilmember Stewart. I'm a little shorter. <laughs> um, thank you all for joining us. I am thrilled uh, to join in on this proclamation. This is my first one as a county council member, and CCI Health and Wellness Center is very near and dear to my heart. Um, even before the pandemic, they were a great partner in serving our communities. And then during the pandemic and COVID-19, they just stood up in so many ways. I can tell you when I was mayor in the city of Tacoma Park and COVID hit, knowing we had a partner and someone like CCI in our community really did help me sleep at night. So thank you so much. And you know, it's about delivering health care, mental health, nutrition programs, but they do it in a way that treats their patients and their families with respect and dignity. And when you visit their clinics, you see that. The attention to detail, how large the exam rooms are so that they fit whole families comfortably, and the uh, education programs. I just appreciate you so much. And I also want to do a shout out that you are a big employer here in Montgomery County as well, employing over 300 people. And I'm proud to say many of them live in my district. So thank you. So I guess that means all of them live in my district. <laughs> so uh, I just want to thank you for the work you do. It is really important that I think the reason why you have the touch with the community that you do have is because of the length of time that you've worked with the community. You've gotten to know people, you've gotten to know the conditions in which people live and have a deeper understanding of their health problems that you're not just seeing somebody who's dealing with health issue, but you're dealing with somebody who's dealing with maybe a myriad of other issues when they come in. And that's been critically important. Your support for the WIC program and making sure that families you know, get the food they need vital to the to the health and safety of this community and you know we're all talking about where we want to go um, in the coming year with uh, with health care because obviously the crisis on one hand showed our ability to respond on the other hand showed our short falls falls and the fact that so many people are presenting with pre-existing conditions uh, if you move away from health and just talk about food, people tell me that the people who are operating the food um, giveaways are dealing with as many people as they dealt with at the height of the pandemic. And so going forward, we'd like to call, you know, you together along with the other providers to start talking about how can we build a more seamless integrated system 
So we serve more people. I know you would serve everybody you can serve, but you have limits and everybody else does. So I look forward to working with you to figure out how we can do this better, make more progress, and I just want to congratulate you on 50 years. There are a lot of community organizations that do this kind of hard work. Don't make it to 50. Congratulations. It's a really good point. I haven't even made it to 50 yet, so it's, uh, you've been doing a lot of good work. <laughs> uh, so we're going to read the proclamation here, and then we'll hear from you, uh, Dr. Broad. Whereas in 1972, Community Clinic, Inc., CCI, was officially registered as a nonprofit in Montgomery County, increasing access to health care for individuals made vulnerable by social, economic, and cultural barriers, and... Whereas the Community Health Center became a federally qualified health center 36 years later and continued to expand services to meet the needs of communities across Montgomery County to include dental care, behavioral health care, nutrition services, prenatal care, family planning, and HIV AIDS prevention, treatment, and care, and... And where... <laughs> And whereas CCI has provided access to the Women, Infant, and Children's Supplemental Nutrition Program, WIC, for 32 years and is the largest provider of WIC in the state of Maryland, operating in 12 locations including Gaithersburg, Rockville, Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, and Wheaton, and serves nearly 70,000 individuals in our community. Whereas the Community Health Center was an active partner in the county's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, keeping their doors open and providing accurate information and access to vaccines, and whereas the health center became CCI Health Services in 2022, capable of offering new services as they continue their 50-year legacy of empowering our neighbors along their health and wellness journey while advocating for access to equitable, quality health care for all. I'm going to take us home. Now, therefore, do we, Mark Elrich, County Executive, Evan Glass, Council President, Will Jawando, Council Member, and Kate Stewart, Council Member of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby celebrate CCI Health Services' 50th anniversary and the legacy of services to Montgomery County residents, presented this 13th day of December in the year 2022, signed by all four of us. <laughs> Big round of applause, please. Dr. Burton, I'm going to lower this for you. Thank you. I was going to say, even lower. <laughs> Thank you. CCI Health Services is so thankful for this proclamation today. We started 50 years ago in a small house in Rockville, Maryland, and now we're a nonprofit health system that serves the needs of more than 70,000 in this county. It is really a testament to the power of community that that is our testimony today. With the partnership, of council members Jawando and Stewart and Evan Glass and of course our county executive. Now we are standing up our own family medicine residency program and launching a program for the all-inclusive care of the elderly and partnering with the county on ending the HIV epidemic. I will tell you that we have our eye on additional partnerships, especially as they relate to providing care in our school systems. But as we wait for those opportunities, what I will say is thanks to this partnership with the folks standing with me today and Evan Glass sitting behind me at 50, we're just getting started. Thank you. So maybe we get used to being back here. Get tight. Where's him?
really. Thank you very much for that important worthwhile proclamation. Thank you again to CCI for all the important work that you do. We are running a few minutes early, so we'll take a few minutes recess. Okay, everybody, it is 9.30. Yes, please. Well, I think we're still on, are we? Are we still on? Yeah, we are. We're still on. Oh, we're not? Okay, then go for it. Okay. We're going live in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning, everybody. It is still Tuesday, December 13th. Uh, we are now starting our official general business for this council session. 
Um, and, and we'll now go to general business. Madam Clerk, do we have any announcements? Good morning, Council President, Council Vice President, Council Members. We have a few agenda updates to announce. Um, consent item 6K has been added. It's a supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY23 operating budget. Department of Transportation, the Chesapeake Bay Trust Urban Tree Grant Award for $148,233. The source of funds is the Chesapeake Bay Trust Fund Urban Trees Grant. The public hearing action is scheduled for January 17, 2023 at 1.30 p.m. Additionally, we've returned to consent calendar for introduction only item L, which is a resolution to approve Executive Regulation 1822 performance-based pay. The Council did not receive any petitions this week, so that's all we have. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk, and the Council has not received any minutes for approval either. Okay, now we'll go on to our first public hearing for expedited Bill 3222, Department of Health and Human Services, Structures and Positions. This bill would add the Chief of Public Health Services as a non-merit position in the Department of Health and Human Services, eliminate the Chief Operating Officer as a non-merit position in the Department of Health and Human Services, and delete the requirement that the County Health Officer also serve as the Chief of the Direct Service Division for Public Health Services in the Department of Health and Human Services. Action is tentatively scheduled for January 17th, 2023. We have one speaker on the agenda. Is uh, Mr. Omar here virtually? He is, not. he is not in attendance. Okay, Mr. Omar is not joining us. I believe he's joining the Zoom now. Oh. Perfect timing if Mr. Omar is with us. Uh, there you are, Mr. Omar. Good morning. Welcome. I see you're still getting settled in. Hi, can you hear me? We hear you. Thank you for joining us. You have two minutes to testify on this. Yeah, okay. So I just want to let you all know that I'm not really an expert in this. When you say testify, it kind of sounds like I'm a part of the council, even though I'm obviously not. I'm actually doing this as like a, this part of an assignment for my journalism class at Montgomery College to write a um, to write a practice article regarding government meetings. I've researched a little a little bit about this bill you're about to talk about here, um, Bill 32-22. You know. And that's kind of what I'm going to be writing about this meeting regarding this <clears throat> particular bill, you know? So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank that's you. Basically, yeah. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, that's it. So, uh, <laughs> well, we can follow up. We'll share with you when there's more public conversation. Um, but right now, you are the only person testifying on this. And so as of right now, this hearing is closed. Mr. Omar, thank you for joining us. Okay. okay I'm... Yes. Thank you. Wait, I mean, you didn't say... You're not saying the meeting is over now, right? Yeah, this is a public hearing. Uh, this is public hearing, and so it's a time for individuals to share their thoughts on the legislation. The legislation will be discussed at another point in time, and I can make sure that the council staff provides that information for you so you can follow it for your journalism class. Oh, so email, send an email, or we, we can we can do that. So thank thank you very much, Mr. Omar, for joining us. Okay, colleagues. We now move to item number two, uh, which is an update on the fiscal plan. Ms. Michelson and Mr. Howard, if you'll join us. Uh, and this public hearing is now closed. I think I already did that, but thank you again, sir. And I'll say also joining us, Councilmember Mink is joining us virtually.
good morning. Um, we have with us today our colleagues from OMB and the Department of Finance who uh, prepared the fiscal update that you have before you. Um, and just a little background on the fiscal plan. Um, the council approves the fiscal plan every year in June. It is a, a, a snapshot in time, but presents projections for six years to look at our best um, estimates of what the revenue picture will be and also um, what that means for ending reserves. It also includes some information about near-term expenditures. Um, the fiscal plan is first submitted in June. It's updated once in December. This is the update you're receiving now. Um, and then a second time in March as the county executive submits um, the budget to you. So this is not really a budget document, but it's an important tool that is used as the executive creates the budget. Um, so what are the big highlights? And I'm going to start on giving you the big picture and then turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Howard, for the details. A uh, big picture is we finished um, fiscal year 2022 very strongly, uh, stronger than thought, um, almost $300 million in excess revenues. Um, it appears at this point in time that fiscal 23 will also end up better than we thought, although a much smaller number. It looks like right now somewhere um, around 20 million, that could change, and I'll talk about that in, in a minute. Um, but the perhaps more important news is that beginning in FY24 and for all the remaining years of the fiscal plan, there's a reduction in the estimated revenues. And if you look at the chart on page um, two of the staff memo, You'll see that um, in each year, the estimates of revenues is less than what was projected in June. Um, and most notably, the revenue growth from FY23 um, to FY24 is now estimated to be 1.1%, um, which is um, very constrained and it will make it challenging for the council to be able to afford all the normal increases you like to provide in a year-over-year -year budget. Um, so um, we're glad that there's good news in the short term um, that may help buffer some of the um, fiscal challenges that we see ahead. Um, the State Board of Revenue Estimates meets on December 15th, unfortunately, just a couple of days after your meeting. Um, we've heard lots of rumors of uh, potential news, both to the good for uh, 2023, but perhaps to the bad for 2024. So we'll be watching for those um, announcements and we'll let you know as soon as we have additional information. Um, and there are other things that could change these forecasts going forward, including um, the unpredictable nature of what could or could not be a recession, um, whether it happens, the scope, the timing, uh, changes to our accessible base, which we're hoping will be positive, um, and you know other changes that may occur between now and the time the budget is submitted. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Howard for a little bit more detail. Thank you. So I'm going to start on page three of the staff report and go into a little bit more detail on some of the components of the fiscal plan and the updated, updates provided by finance and OMB staff. So first, if you look at total revenues, you know, as some background, uh, most county revenues are derived from taxes. And in FY23, 88% of the county's taxes and 70% of the county's total revenues are from property and income tax. And this is, you know, the, not a change from other fiscal years, but those are the two big drivers of our, uh, of our revenue. And you can see that a little bit more in detail on the table on page three. Another key component of the fiscal update that I want to make sure is noted is that state aid, um, which is shown in the other revenues line, is held flat and held constant across all the different agencies. And this is done each year in the as part of the December update. No changes are made to that. Um, most of the, the state aid comes uh, for Montgomery County Public Schools, MCPS. And so one area that we'll know more, have more information on in the March and April timeframe is whether there's additional state aid coming for um, MCPS or the other uh, other county agencies, which can provide some additional flexibility when we actually reach the uh, budget decision making. 
But in FY23, finance does um, estimate total revenues will be $22.6 million greater than the FY23 uh, approved budget. In terms of the specific line items that make up the revenues, property tax is estimated to be $28.2 million less than the FY23 uh, assumption, which is a decrease of 1.4%. This reduction comes from, you know, it's a com combination of several factors, including updated assessable valuations as the state goes through its cycle every three years of, um, of, different, of assessing, reassessing county properties, um, actual billing and collections data to date, as well as reduced personal property tax estimates. For income tax revenues, finance estimates this will be $85.4 million greater than the FY23 approved budget. And so this is the, the revenue source that's um, driving the increase, the overall increase in FY23. So this increase is based on actual distributions to date uh, from the state, as well as an assumption that additional distributions will be made to the county as early as January to reflect income taxes associated with, with pass-through entity filings and, and, and other similar types of um, uh, taxpayer filings. So in the, as part of the November distribution, the county actually received $70 million less than anticipated uh, from the tax liability from the 2021 tax year. But after reviewing the data of the, the number of tax returns and information that's still um, outstanding that the state expects to process, as well as looking at the experience of last year where the county did receive a um, additional distribution in March of $68, $68 million um, related to this issue, uh, finance does anticipate we will receive um, that additional funding hopefully as early as January. Um, so with that, though, council staff does note that this is an area of sensitivity within the fiscal plan, um, and the actual revenues received could end up uh, lower or um, also hopefully higher uh, than the current estimate, and we'll have to see what happens over the next few months. Then with transfer and recordation tax revenues, finance does estimate that these will be $33.6 million less than the FY23 approved budget. This de decreases due to the actual volume of sales as well as a lower median uh, sales price um, than was originally assumed when the budget was approved. And overall, these decreases are reflecting a weakening in the real estate market, which can be an early indicator of an economic slowdown. So that's something we'll have to keep an eye on and see how that plays out. On the expenditure side, typically there's not a lot of adjustments made to expenditures as part of the December fiscal plan update, but there are two key things that OMB did update that I want to point out. First, OMB does estimate that the county government's expenditures overall will be about $19.4 million greater than approved, and this is primarily from three sources. Um, additional spending in Department of Health and Human Services related to ongoing um, COVID response an increased uh, participation rate in the Working Families Income Supplement Program, as well as anticipated overtime expenses in Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Services. And OMB does anticipate transmitting supplemental appropriations to the council in the winter timeframe to um, recognize these additional expenditures. The other issue is that OMB does estimate adding approximately $60 million in new expenditures in FY23. And these new expenditures are coming from the county's general fund reserves. About $45 million of this is from supplemental or special appropriations that have been approved since the start of the fiscal year. And the other $15 million is an expenditure placeholder for snow, snow removal and storm cleanup. And this is the, the same amount that is included every year for those potential expenditures. In terms of reserves, we have good news for how the county ended FY22. Uh, we ended at 13.2% of the general fund reserves, exceeding the 10% policy level. And so correspondingly, the FY23 uh, reserves are currently estimated to end at 12.3%, again, above that 10% policy level. And if this projection holds, this will provide the county with additional flexibility to buffer against any uh, projected revenue shortfalls in FY24 um, and potential further reductions if there is an economic slowdown. And the last piece I wanted to highlight relates to compensation sustainability. And as part of the reserve and selected fiscal policies resolution, uh, the council did um, adopt uh, a policy that total annual compensation costs, the growth rate of those should be similar to the annual growth rate of tax supported revenues. So each year and as part of the December update, we provide an update on, on what that could, could mean for, um, for those growth rates. 
And so with a fiscal update estimating tax supported revenue growth of 1.1% from 23 to 24, um, there's obviously still several factors that are unknown about compensation costs, including what the executive uh, might negotiate with uh, labor partners. Um, but a similar 1.1% growth rate in those tax supported costs would equate to approximately $12.2 million. So for context. And with that, I will turn it back to the council president for any uh, questions that you all may have. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Michelson uh, and Mr. Howard. Uh, I, I want to recognize that uh, Mr. Covey is is joining us virtually, and Ms. Bryan and Mr. Waters are here as well. Do you have any uh, opening comments or thoughts before we begin the conversation? Good morning. I'd like to um, welcome all of you to the county council. Um, those of you who have run, won your respective races. Um, and those who are returning. Uh, also, congratulations to Council President Glass and Council Vice President Friedson for your nomination on leadership on the County Council. Um, I don't have a lot to add to the points that Ms. Michelson and Mr. Howard have made here in this packet. As um, they noted, it, um, it appears that we are projecting some uh, type of economic slowdown. It is a mild projection um, of an economic slowdown in the out years. However, our revenues currently are pretty robust. Uh, we are uh, carefully monitoring expenses and trying to make sure that we as a county government are not, our expenses are not outpacing our revenue growth and or our revenue projections. So um, we do have some economic pressures or some expenditure pressures that are on the budget both in FY23 and as we develop FY24 budget, um, we will be looking at those expenses a little closer. Uh, earlier this year, we have um, put out directions to departments as they develop their FY24 budgets that they should be judicious in their request um, and identify some savings if they have um, initiatives or other enhancements that they would like to see in the budget, they were instructed to find some types of offsetting um, expenditures to accommodate those uh, enhancements. That may not be possible in all cases. We realize there are still a lot of community needs that are um, that need to be addressed. We need to address also any changes in enrollment with MCPS and our obligations to Montgomery College and our other outside partners like WSSC and Park and Planning. Um, so we are cognizant that uh, although the revenues are robust, we still have some pressures on the budget that we must um, be um, very, um, how should we say, uh, mindful of as we move forward, um, finishing out 23 and moving towards through 23 and moving towards development of FY24. So we, um, we just want to make sure, and, and I appreciate the work that council staff did with um, the executive branch, both the Office of Man Management Budget and Finance on um, coming to a, a consensus on what this fiscal picture looks like and um, look forward to a more collaborative uh, relationship moving forward in the future. But um, as uh, they have both pointed out, we want to be cautious, we want to be stewards of the taxpayers' funds, um, but also know uh, and realize, as you all do in the county executive, that there are a lot of community needs and there will be some, some choices to be made. We are hopeful that our revenues will continue to be robust and that we will get some great news coming up here as the Board of um, Revenue Estimates meets in the next couple of days and revises um, their income and their revenue estimates for uh, the remainder of the year and um, going into January. So um, with that said, we are hopeful that we will see some good news um, early in FY23 and um, can prepare a budget that um, serves all of the needs that we can um, provide at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bryant. Uh, I will turn it over to the chair of the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee, uh, Council, Council Member Stewart, to kick off the conversation. Great. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to thank you all uh, for the presentation today and in particular thank the, uh, the staff for your memo and the clarity of it. Um, very much appreciate it. Um, and understanding that this is uh, where we are, this is a snapshot, our uh, fiscal picture right now and as you 
have underscored for us. We will be getting news. I think there's some national news um, happening right now today as we sit here. Hopefully some looks like it's pretty good, uh, but we'll wait and see. And then we'll wait and see uh, what the state has for us later in this week. Um, having said that, though, um, as we are planning and moving forward, I, I do have a request. Um, we talk about specifically in the report a $61.8 million in new additional um, expenses for this fiscal year. Um, I think many of us know what some of those are, but I think it would be very helpful uh, if we could um, have a memo outlining what has already been um, spent and then any anticipated for the rest of this fiscal year and if it's possible why those weren't in the budget originally so that those of us who are new and I think probably for my colleagues returning it would be helpful to know why there were certain things that um, came to us in appropriations and weren't budgeted originally as we are looking forward and planning for FY24 um, but I just want to say thank you uh, for the information and look forward to working with you all thank you uh, thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Stewart. Uh, next up is Councilmember Friedson. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Mr. President. Thank you to our chair, uh, our new chair. Really appreciate it, and I think that's a terrific request. I'm really pleased that uh, you have uh, asked for it. I think it's really important, and uh, we have to make sure that we are budgeting during budget years and saving special and unique uh, budget actions for special and unique circumstances. And I think we all can... Uh, do a, a better job of, of that. Um, a few things. First of all, undeniably, this is good news. So I think it's important that we note that. And I think it's a reflection of some of the decisions that have made, been made at the federal level that have put us in a better position than we otherwise would have been. The county is better off because of actions that the federal government has stepped in to help us with. Uh, and the economy is better off because of those uh, actions by uh, the President and the Congress. So I think, you know, it's it's important that uh, the 800-pound gorilla, we can't take credit uh, here for uh, things that uh, we uh, don't deserve credit for, but we can take advantage of the benefits that have come uh, from it. Uh, the reality, though, is, you know, I, I think what has happened already is better than we expected. But what is happening now and what is, is expected to happen moving forward is probably not going to be as good as uh, we have expected. And so the, the good news is the base is better. The, the challenge is what is the drop off from that base and then how do we plan accordingly? And I think admirably the executive branch uh, has attempted to do that and I want to give credit for that. It's not an easy thing to do and I ultimately uh, the uh, Board of Revenue Estimates will meet and we'll have to adjust uh, accordingly. Uh, but I expect there to be a significant write-down of income taxes from that meeting later this week uh, for the future. Uh, again, a better base from, from where we started, but there's going to be a bigger drop-off from that base. And the question is, is the increase in the base bigger than the new drop-off from that base? You'd always rather, it's always healthier to have a stronger uh, base. And so I think we need to be very cautious uh, and we need to be prepared for that. All of the indicators are showing certain things, including the fact that our costs are up. So our revenues are up and some of the decisions that have been made to make sure that those revenues are up have also led for costs to come up. Now, you know, that is stabilizing a bit, which is good news, but it also is a demonstration that the economy is slowing down in, in a healthy way. It might, it might not necessarily be a bad thing, but we have to be uh, prepared for that. So a, a few uh, questions regarding income tax specifically. What are the assumptions that are baked into this uh, update in terms of uh, expectations for, for income taxes in percentage based on what we were expecting in the budget that we approved last year and what we have here both in uh, total income tax uh, and uh, in uh, capital gains. Um, I don't know if I, Mr. Our, our staffs are here to um, answer any questions that you guys may have, and I think this may be directed to yeah. my colleague Michael Covey. Yes. So I'll pass it over to him. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Friedman. Good, good questions. Um, I am. <clears throat> I will defer to uh, staff on this, but. On the income tax in particular, well, keep in mind that we are 
assuming a mild recession, we use Moody's analytics B2 or S2 scenario for calendar year 23, which, again, is a mild recession. We can't time the recession. We don't know if it will happen in 23 or 24. But most economists, even today, even yesterday when Reuters came out with a big poll, are saying that there is a high likelihood that there's going to be at least a mild recession during 23 or 24. As far as the income tax estimates, there will be more detail on these when the revenue estimators group report comes out in a couple days. I don't know that we'll be able to fully use whatever the Board of Revenue Estimates is going to be putting out that day since we'll be writing it, finalizing it right now, and they're not meeting until Thursday. And as you noted, these are sort of interim revenue estimates because of the fact that we only have one of the larger distributions in hand right now. The other really large one is the February distribution. The January distribution, which is normally a very small distribution, last year was almost zero, might actually be one of the higher distributions in the next few months because of the same issues that the controller has noticed over the last couple of years. PTE filings or pass-through entity filings, excuse me, are still difficult for them to manage. The fact that the state pushed the April 15th filing deadline into July again meant that the controller's office staff has three fewer months to do their work. So we know that there's a lot outstanding for the 2021 tax year, which is what a large portion of the November reconciliation portion of the November distribution represents. We know for a fact that there are over 1,100 accounts for Montgomery County returns, or I should say returns, 1,100 plus returns that the state controller's office has not yet processed. That is a similar amount to last year when the county received a special income tax distribution in March of $68 million, which actually was higher than what we even expected at that point. We also know that there is, we actually have identified income tax liability that's still outstanding and hasn't been tied to any particular jurisdiction in the state's numbers. And in the September Board of Revenue Estimates meeting, they noted that a large portion of the growth in Maryland personal income tax during the 2021 tax year was attributable to pass-through entities. And again, we got a very large share of the pass-through entity filings. The pass-through entities are things like S corporations and partnerships, and those are often lawyers, doctors, small advisory firms, things like that. There are an awful lot of them in Montgomery County. So mitigated by the fact that with holdings and salary taxes were actually much higher in November, was the fact that the additional filings that I was just talking about were much lower. But we expect, because of all the things that I just said, that we will actually make up for that sometime between January and March, more than likely, and probably earlier this year than last year. Last year, if you recall, we actually, and a number of other counties, were asking questions of the state controller's office and the Bureau of Revenue Estimates, which prompted them to do more analysis and to then let us know that there was an issue with the pass-through entity or PTE filings, and that again resulted in that special distribution in March. But we have actually more information than that 
to this year, and it's uh, and it would uh, it prompted us to be uh, sort of in line with what we received last year. But there's a high likelihood that we'll actually receive more than the roughly seventy million dollars we're estimating right now. Uh, although, as you noted, we should be circumspect. Uh, we always are cautious about these things. Uh, it is it is possible that income taxes could come in lower than what we expected. Uh, it is highly likely, though, that FY23 revenues will come in uh, will come in on track with the approved FY23 budget or higher. It, it's not very likely at this point that they'll come in lower, which is which is a good thing. And we don't know, of course, if there's going to be a recession or not. If you watched 60 Minutes a couple nights ago, you will have noticed that Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen was on, and uh, she spoke almost exclusively about uh, about trying to engineer a so-called soft landing. Um, and, and she said she was pretty confident that the Fed under Chairman Powell uh, is doing that right now. So hopefully we won't have a recession. If we do, hopefully it'll be very short and very mild. And our estimates are based on, again, a, a, a mild recession that is short, but, uh, but uh, somewhat deep, but it's short enough that it's, it ends up being a mild recession. Appreciate that. I think it's important that it's not just the amount of money that comes in moving forward but where it's coming from because we'll know how old mm -hmm. the data is and what that means for revenues moving forward so i'm paying special attention to fourth quarter true ups on uh on on um uh on, on filers as opposed to these ptes i have every confidence that you're right that the ptes are similar to last year and we're going to see a substantial bump but that's a uh, you know, that's not telling the broader story of what's happening with all the rest of the income tax. And so I think we need to pay special close attention to that. I would hope that the revenue estimating group plays a central role in jointly determining what these assumptions are and agreeing upon them. That was the intention of the bill that this body passed under the leadership of the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee that follows that state model. I know that it's still a work in progress, but I would urge and implore uh, that uh, this be an ongoing collaborative effort and not a group that meets on a one-off basis uh, and to approve something that's already been predetermined. The idea was that we were bringing together the executive branch, the Office of Legislative Oversight and Council staff together to do this in a collaborative function, a model that is widely credited with why the state maintains its AAA bond rating because it's seen as a national model. So I hope that uh, you'll uh, continue to move that forward with uh, uh, fidelity. Uh, and I would uh, request, similarly to the chair's request, it's not going to be available likely for the revenue estimating groups meeting because you'll be working in re real time, but doing a deep dive into specifically the income tax assumptions from the December meeting of the Board of Revenue Estimates and compare that to the assumptions that the county is having. I imagine that they're not going to be the exact same because our residents comprise a different demographic as taxpayers than the state says as a whole, but it should mirror uh, in some form or fashion because we do make up a disproportionate share of the state's uh, income tax. And if you could you know, perhaps report that similarly uh, back to the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee as the chair uh, requested. We will do that. Um, you will also most likely see a request from this group that the legislation establishing it, which had specific dates that the dates be modified a bit so that we can report after. That was going to be my next question. We put in <laughs> dates uh, which we worked on, which we thought would, would work based on the calendar that we were looking at at the time. It appears that we're off by a couple days. So I exactly. think that's so something we, that perhaps we, we the committee are looking into can, that and we will have a recommendation. Uh, maybe colleagues that. and I can join together and put something in to, to clarify that. I'd love to work with them uh, on that. And then the last uh, question we might not be able to get into today, but I really do think we need to do a a deep dive briefing into the FEMA reimbursements. It's been an ongoing conversation at this body. It has not gone as swiftly as we would have hoped. We're not going to uh, receive that money at the timeline that we had originally expected. There's no one to blame here. It's a challenging environment, but we have made major co comments and assumptions uh, based on uh, that uh, funding and expectations. The good news is we're not relying on them 
now because we have better news elsewhere, but we need to focus on them. And so I don't think now is the appropriate time, but I would hope that we come back either in committee or at full council. I'll yield to the council president and the chair on how that is determined, but I think it would be uh, beyond appropriate for this body to do a deep dive in that. With that, I yield back to you, Mr. President. I think that sounds like a, a sound course of action. Um, council Member Sales, you're up. Um, thank you, Council President. And so I um, want to echo the sentiments of my colleagues. Thank you for the uh, positive fiscal outlook uh, that you shared. Um, Council Member, Council Vice President Friedson uh, took one of my questions about the FEMA reimbursement. So look forward to some updates and how we can be helpful with um, following up. Please let us know. Um, I did have a question about the excess in revenues because this is the second fiscal year in a row that we've had some uh, um, additional reserves. And so I wanted to know, have we tapped into those reserves from fiscal year 22? And So I'll, I'll start and then ask uh, OMB to, to jump in and, and flesh out anything I've missed. But yes, so the, the additional you know, 45 approximately million dollars in supplemental appropriations have been approved since the start of the fiscal year does did draw down on the reserves. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the reason that th that was able to happen was because there was excess without while staying above that 10% reserve policy level was because there was excess revenues to draw down from. Okay, and so are we putting any of that money towards any underfunded programs? So any, any additional, sorry, Joshua Waters, I'm the Deputy Director for OMB. Um, any additional funding for those programs would have to be approved by the Council through a supplemental or special appropriation. So where there has been need identified, that's where those appropriations have come forward. Um, generally speaking, for these additional revenues, you know, there's, a, there's a provision in statute that requires um, a portion of unanticipated revenue growth go, does not go into the general fund on designated reserves. It goes into a special fund that can only be appropriated by council. It's kind of locked, locked in there. Um, so that said, only a portion of the overage, the, the revenue surplus, is available as undesignated reserves. And so that those are the funds that are used through supplemental and special appropriations. And anything unused in one fiscal year then goes to the bottom line of the next fiscal year that can be used by the executive and council as you're structuring the budget for FY24. Okay, okay. I had a, another question about um, the hubs. Do we know if the uh, Montgomery County's uh, hubs will continue to be funded after this fiscal year? I know it is um, certainly the executive's desire to um, continue that model and to make sure that uh, we have a model that is present within the communities themselves. Um, his interest is certainly there and, um, and intends on funding the hub models going forward. It, um, the level of funding, of course, will depend on the fiscal picture and other priorities of the executive and or the county council. So um, I believe it is his intent to continue the hub models. Okay, and are we evaluating the uh, services and the funding levels for these hubs? So we're working with the department as they bring in their budget request to evaluate um, the services provided, the level of services needed for the, those particular communities that are being served by the hubs. Um, that said, we are, just to say, we are at the very early stages of reviewing the departmental requests mm -hmm. uh, for the following fiscal year, and those conversations generally will take place between now and middle toward the end of February. So until I, I've not had a chance to look at the, the budget request for the Health and Human Services Department, uh, the OMB analysts right now are, are engaging with the department with their questions and the back and forth, trying to, to look at all the requests the department has. And I may have missed this, but did we talk about ARPA funds and how they play a role in this fiscal picture? Are there any funds remaining? So we can do an update on, um, similar to the FEMA, we can do an update on ARPA for the council to talk about how all the ARPA funds have been distributed, and we can work with the executive branch to get a, uh, a spending report 
um, for the those funds that have been approved. You know how much has been spent, what remains, what's the anticipated spend out, and, and things like that. So we will we will bring that back to you. All right. Thank you. I yield. Good question, and I appreciate having another update on ARPA to bring everybody up to speed. Uh, next up, Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's good to see everybody. This is good news. I think the headline here is cautiously optimistic, and I, like many of my colleagues, have been around for a long time, and I know we've had some tough years, and it's nice to know this doesn't look like it's shaping up to be one. Um, I did have a question, though, regarding the capital budget. We've heard, understandably, through the grapevine, that construction costs are significantly higher, particularly for school construction costs because of inflation, because of supply chain issues. Um, do we have an, a sense of what the scope of that number might be? Because we have been given a heads up that there is a chance that we may need to revisit the CIP uh, and update accordingly to help address some of those fiscal challenges. At this time, we don't have a complete scope of what that total may be. Um, MCPS is experiencing extraordinary inflation as our county departments who are responsible for building our facilities, recreation centers and libraries, and also Montgomery College as well. So we are looking um, to see what that solution will look like. Um, we are also uh, engaging our state partners to um, find out whether there's some flexibility at the state level with the $2 billion um, surplus that they have identified. So we're hoping between what the county is able to provide and what we are able to garner from the state resources that um, we will be in a better place as far as our school construction schedule and funding those projects and their, um, their inflationary impacts of those projects in the future. Thank you, Ms. Bryant. Is there any concern about timing as we prepare the next operating budget? And I know none of us enjoy having to do significant appropriations in the middle of the year, which throws everything off. Um, is there any concern about timing? Um, I wouldn't say there's necessarily a concern about timing, but there are some cash resources that are used in the capital budget. And of course, with the revenue picture being a little uncertain at this time, um, we will, I'm sure the county executive will want to weigh those cash obligations for the uh, capital budget against the obligations and um, the desires for um, expansions and or sustainability of the um, FY24 operating budget. So it will be um, a tricky dance to, to, um, to perform, but we are confident that, you know, we can work it out in the end. And just to follow up, um, Councilmember Albanos, the, um, um, I think you, you've hit on an important point, which is that expenditures in the CIP are likely to be higher than anticipated due to inflation. At the same time, we see a drop in recordation taxes, which is one of the sources used to fund the CIP. Um, and so once you get to budget, um, I think one of the things the council will need to look at is whether some of the excess revenues that appear to be likely in FY23 might be used to help assist with the CIP. Um, and, you know, we'll come back to you with those issues when we, when we get closer to budget. Terrific. Yep, that's what I figured. Uh, Mr. Covey and Ms. Bryant, thank you both for helping shepherd the process to ensure our AAA bond rating again remains a very strong partnership between the legislative and executive branches. And I know we scored high points uh, for having higher than 10 percent reserves which is, of course, important. So uh, appreciate everybody's efforts. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Um, I'm also happy to have good news whenever it comes, however long it lasts. Um, and I think uh, that, you know, that's a good thing. Hopefully we'll get more good news later this week. I think the the news, the initial news from national landscape about inflation ticking downward is good, uh, not only for our fiscal outlook, but for consumers, for our residents. Um, we'll see what action the Fed takes uh, tomorrow um, in their interest rate discussions, which I hopefully will also be improved. Um, I think it's good that you're planning for a mild recession. You should always plan for the worst and be happy when that doesn't come. Um, and I appreciate uh, the way you've worked with us to kind of lay this out in the in the out years. Um, I do think the timing issue is one we're going to have to continue to look at. I'm, I'm glad that was brought up because I feel like, you know, every year we're here and we're kind of like, well, we'll see and we'll wait a week or two and this, we're getting closer. 
Um, and so that I'm, I'm glad we're going to work on that. Obviously, next week, and, and now my role as chair of the education committee, the uh, superintendent will present her operating budget request to the board and to the public uh, on Monday. And obviously, I think that uh, funding our school system and our teachers and students and staff, obviously the largest part of our budget, is going to be really important as we work to come out of this uh, trauma that has been on all of us, particularly our students, our young people, and our teachers, our educators. Uh, so that's going to be something we're looking at with interest and in having to figure out. Um, I, I did want to ask uh, about the uh, the income tax growth and the recordation tax. Um, on, let's start with the recordation tax. On the, uh, obviously, home prices, it's cooled, the market's cooled. Do we have a deeper dive analysis and can you share anything today about which segment of the market is cooled and where we're seeing uh, activity and where we're not as far as the the, the price sure. of the sale yeah. yeah go ahead Mike yeah I'm sorry Mr. Jelano sorry about that um, yeah I uh, honestly commercial activity is uh, not running uh, terribly behind pace but uh, residential activity has both fallen uh, drastically in terms of the number of uh, property transfers but also the amount of money uh, re uh, realized in the transfer and recordation tax because of the uh, fall in the number of transfers and, and this is attributable directly to uh, to mortgage rates having increased very substantially uh, since last summer, of course. Uh, and, you know, when you see the Revenue Estimators Group uh, report uh, later this week, uh, we do write about this. Uh, it's not finished yet, so I don't really want to uh, get into it too much right now, but you'll see it in a few days. Um, the uh, Housing transactions, transfers, if you will, are a leading current indicator uh, for the economy. Uh, and, and that's the one sector right now that is uh, most problematic for us, or one of the sectors that's most problematic for us. That being said, FY22 was a huge year for, uh, for property transactions and both transfer and recordation tax as a result of that. Um, and uh, when we did the estimates for FY23 uh, that um, you all approved in the uh, FY23 approved budget, excuse the last council, excuse me, uh, the, uh, we, had, we had actually written back or written down uh, the huge growth that was in FY22. But at the time we were building uh, the FY23 budget, around this time last year, uh, uh, it wasn't clear, and, and the Fed wasn't saying anything about long-term uh, 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 inflation. And so, you know, the transitory inflation that they were talking about a year ago ended up being, uh, I guess, non-transitory. Um, and so that, you know, affected uh, mortgage rates all the way up until very recently, where they, uh, they've sort of been seesawing over the last uh, month or two, going uh, up a bit and down a bit. But they are significantly higher than they were a year ago. And that's made people more likely to put off any, uh, any home buying uh, until they're comfortable with either the new rates or uh, with rates uh, as they hopefully come down shortly. I, I appreciate that. Does that answer your question? It, it does. And I think, you know, I'll just put another marker. I appreciate the distinction between commercial and residential. I'd also like to mm -hmm. dig in a little more, and we can do it after we get the update, on the, the within the residential, the sale price. Where, where you, are you seeing activity at the high end on the million plus? Or, you know, and what's where is that year to year? I think it's important to right. just be aware of that. Um, and, and where that is. Uh, the, the other thing I'll, I'll point out, and when you brought up that we had a, a booming year in recordation tax, I, I lose sleep that we didn't take advantage of that personally. Uh, and, and, and look at the rates. We could have, we could have helped our, our revenue quite a bit if we would have made an adjustment uh, you know, in previous council, but hey, that's, it, it's, it's neither here nor there. Um, I do think that, you know, as I've mentioned before, we're going to need to look at uh, 
more progressivity in both the local income tax and different types of property tax classifications. And our, our delegation is looking into that. Um, and they were going to have some bills on both of those items. Uh, I think we need to have all the tools in the toolbox available to us, but uh, to, to especially as we look to 24, 20, 25, the outlook here. Um, we look to the CIP, which was discussed. Uh, I want to make sure that we have everything available. So I uh, look forward to more of those discussions and, and just appreciate all of uh, the work that you all have done. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Uh, Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the briefing. Uh, um, the accountant in me really uh, enjoys this, this stuff. Um, so I just wanted to piggyback on what Councilmember Stewart uh, suggested about the supplementals to look back at the tally of, of what that number entails. But, but going forward, I think it would be really helpful uh, when we receive a supplemental request to, to have an ongoing tally of, of where that is um, uh, how much has been, how much we have approved, and what the uh, total is, and if possible, uh, and this might be um, not available, the impact on the reserve of that specific request, um, or, or a general reminder of what the reserve is at a given date and time. Um, I think now it's um, in this budget scenario. Uh, we have the reserves, but if we are heading into a time when we wouldn't, I think it's important to have that. So that would be great. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and I certainly associate myself with much of what has already been said by my colleagues. And I certainly thank all of you for working on this on a continual basis. And I wanted to point out that um, I certainly agree with my colleagues on government operations and congratulate the new chair and the old guy who's on the committee, um, Vice President Freitzen. Um, we've had a very strong base from government operations from former uh, chair, uh, Councilmember Navarro. And I think I can see her, I mean, maybe she can see us if she's watching the meeting. But I can see her thinking of talking about the reserves and how very important and the AAA bond rating is. And uh, we, we need to continue not to take that for granted. We need to continue to make such an effort. Um, when we first started, and I, I guess it's been a couple of uh, government operation committees back, but when we first started, we were so very concerned about debt service in Montgomery County. Um, I remember the first time I ran and said, and came from a place that didn't have debt, but uh, I remember saying that if debt were a department in Montgomery County, it is not, but if it were a department in Montgomery County, it would be the third largest expenditure that we have. And if that doesn't scare somebody, it should. And we made a concerted effort to make certain that that be reduced over time not in one day, but over time to, to uh, get us back to a, a right number. Um, the, re the recordation tax, transfer tax, is probably the most volatile tax we have, and it's fine to count on it once it's there. I I'm a, you know, an old retailer, and, and a retail, you, you, you count the money that's on your counter, not necessarily what you think is going to be there. And, and I think we have to consider how we, how we use the recordation tax, we certainly should spend our money properly, but I think that's also uh, uh, something to keep in mind. And I, th I believe I'm right on this, it's memory on this one, but there's, at one point we had a percentage, a, a number of how, what, what small percentage it was of people's income tax, and, and the very few, you know what I'm, I'm saying, of, of how many few uh, uh, taxpayers really are the bulk of most of their income tax. Uh, and if we could get that number, please, to remind me and to certainly help uh, uh, new people and, and returning people as well, that we need to keep that in mind. We need to make certain that we keep everyone happy, but especially the people whose, whose numbers really are the the bulk of, of their and, income tax. And Council Member yeah. Katz, you might be recalling comments about how the top 50 taxpayers the top in 50? our county 
um, dramatically shape our income um, year in and year out. So. And, and I remember when, and I couldn't remember the number. I knew, but I remember asking him twice when it was when it was mentioned. I said, "Did you just say five zero or whatever it was?" Because that is a concern. So I think all of this information is necessary. I think that we are we missed it by two days to know for sure. And you know what? Next time when we try this again, we'll miss it by a day. I mean, that's just the way the the system does or doesn't work with us. But. I, I think we're heading in the right direction. We're being extremely careful. We're we're spending our money a, a wisely and saving people's lives. But you need to continue to do that. And with that, I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Katz. I appreciate the perspective uh, which you've shared. Uh, Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so I, I'm, I'm greatly appreciative of all of the, the questions and, and follow-up information that everybody's been requesting and um, to the point where we have federal funds that are going to be coming in and that haven't maybe been delivered in the way that we had anticipated or we couldn't draw down in quite the time frame um, expected. We also have concerns with expenditures not necessarily either equaling what was anticipated or taking longer than anticipated. And so one of my, or my ask, it's only one ask, um, my ask for you is that I'd like to be able to have information for all of us that relates to the procurement cycles that have taken place going back to at least fiscal year 21, if possible. Um, and I defer to you and your expertise as to whether it would be more relevant for me to have or us to have um, information uh, from starting with fiscal year 20, depending on, you know, you know your numbers, you know your your things. But the time to delivery from the time the, deci the procurement decision is made has been delayed significantly during this period of time. And the cost of delivery has also been um, increased. And it would be helpful to know what the original cost and original time to delivery was anticipated to be versus what the actual was and how that has pushed forward cycle over cycle into what is being done with the budgeting um, so that we collectively can anticipate that and help to shape that uh, moving forward with with that in mind so thank you thank you councilmember Ludke um, yeah you know, I appreciate listening to all the comments from my colleagues and as I just noted uh, a, a minute ago I appreciated councilmember Katz's perspective uh, particularly regarding debt services where we've come from, what we're trying to do, and I will share with everybody, particularly uh, the six new members of the council, that four years ago when we had this update, it was not so much a fiscal plan update, but a budget reduction update. And I was here in my second meeting from this dais discussing how we cut $44 million from the budget. Welcome to the council. Uh, and so this update is a much more optimistic one. It's a more welcome one, and I think the sentiment that we've all shared, uh, I, would, I would support that we are cautiously op optimistic about the outlook here, eyes wide open about the national economic situation that may or may not transpire, uh, but the fundamentals of our budget and our fiscal stewardship um, are in place to weather what might come. Uh, and so I appreciate the work here. And I just do have one question as well. Um, looking at the, the slowing growth rates from FY24 to 28, um, can you go into a little bit more detail about how some of those changes in financials might affect our CIP program? Uh, and I know Councilmember Albernaz asked about inflation, and that clearly eats into it. Uh, but with regarding the slowing growth rates, what, what might that mean? Um, any slowing growth rate in the out, outer years, as we are now preparing a biennial CIP, which is a limited scope of projects we're looking at, which is not turned out to be as limited as we initially anticipated because of the inflationary factors. Um, next year, of course, we'll be looking at every project in the capital budget and at that time seeing what impact inflation has had on the capital budget and um, how we will um, manage through that. Uh, there, there are a number of options that the county executive and the county council could take. Um, it may be that we could afford to do less. 
in, in the capital budget. There are fewer projects. Projects may have to be delayed. Um, those would be some of the outcomes if the fiscal picture does not improve um, or get dramatically better. Uh, but, you know, that is still to be seen um, and how we work through those types of scenarios in the future years, but those are very real conversations that the county executive and OMB and finance are having and that the council will have to have ultimately as well. But, you know, th there could be implications that you just can't afford to do everything in any given year. Um, you have projects that are currently either in the very late planning stages going to construction bids, which we would have to um, give some deference to because they are in the middle of the process and about to be built. And then there are others that are coming up for planning that are also equally important. Um, but we will have to, you know, there will be choices that will have to be made if that picture does not improve. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councilmember Sales has a question. Thank you, Council President. Um, when Council Member um, Jawando brought up the education budget, it um, sparked a question about our upcoming uh, grant allocation season. What is the um, the dates for the grant season? Do we know? I don't have those off the top of my head. We can get those for you. Okay, because, um, you know, I've been attending some of these budget hearings across the county and we're hearing that a lot of count, a lot of communities aren't hearing about when the grant applications are due, what the process is, and ultimately they're going to be losing out on funds. And when we're talking about a surplus in the budget, um, you know, our nonprofit sector um, helps fill a lot of the holes where government cannot. And so want to make sure that we're also including that in um, any of these uh, community meetings that we're having. Um, another program that I heard was underfunded um, is the bike share program, especially in East County. And so if we have um, additional reserves, if we can start to think about where this funding you know, the excess funding can go, that would be helpful before it comes to earmarks and such. That's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councilmember Sales. Uh, Councilmember Mink. Hi, everyone. Um, joining from the big screen, good to see you all. Thank you, everyone, for being here today, and thank you for this um, pretty positive fiscal outlook. Uh, I wanted to echo Council Member Jawanda's interest in the recordation taxes, um, especially given the importance for funding the CIP and making sure that we take care of school projects that have been delayed for a long time and seeing how incorporating more progressivism there could help us make sure that we are in good standing to make sure that those critical projects move forward. Some of them, again, including in my district, delayed for a decade or more. Um, also interested in, uh, you know, we, we're seeing a national trend that ec that is echoed in Montgomery County um, with a gr greatly increasing wealth disparity. We have, I think, nine billionaires in Maryland, including a, a number in Montgomery County, who have seen extraordinary increases in their wealth, um, while folks on the lower end of the income spectrum have seen decreases. And so finding ways to help balance that and to make sure that we are being responsible about how we um, you know accrue the revenues that we need to keep our to keep our county running and uh, looking for ways to incorporate more progressivism we may, we may see some opportunities coming from the state to incorporate more progressivism into our income taxes and would also be interested in looking at how that could help us thank you thank you councilmember mink not seeing any other comments or questions i just want to thank you all for this update clearly there are a number of uh, briefings and conversations that colleagues have requested not only ARPA but when we do get the disbursement or the better more improved outlook or better outlook uh, from from the state uh, make sure that we schedule either geo conversation or another briefing here uh, but again uh, as we look back and look forward we are in a good place we have to be mindful of all the economics and I know we'll continue this conversation so thank you all for being here this morning Okay, colleagues, we're going to move to the next agenda item.
in which we sit as the district council. And so we're sitting in district council session. And the first item on that session is the introduction of zoning text amendment 2211, technical corrections. The lead sponsor is council member Friedson. A uh, public hearing will be held on January 17th at 1.30 in the afternoon. Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, I'll just yield to staff. This is uh, being uh, introduced really at the request of staff uh, at a high level. Essentially, the uh, council changed its rules to accommodate the additional new council members and made a, n a number of other technical changes. Uh, we did that in the interim period where there is a hold on zoning changes. And so this is the complementary effort uh, related to the uh, zoning code to reflect the changes that have been made. They're technical in nature and they're all recommended by staff. I'll yield to Ms. Nadu to speak further to it. I have nothing to add. Thank you. There you go. Well, we will have a public hearing on January 17th, and then a planning housing committee work session will be scheduled at a later date. So ZTA 2211 has been introduced. Next, we'll go to the second item, which is a zoning text amendment 2212, overlay zones, Clarksburg East and West environmental overlay exemptions. Public hearing will be scheduled for January 17th at 1.30 in the afternoon with a planning housing committee work session to be scheduled at a later date. Ms. Nadu. Good morning, council members. So this ZTA was actually sent over by the planning board back in 2020. I believe it was supposed to be introduced the exact week that we shut down for COVID. And so the decision at the time was to not go through a difficult ZTA when we were still figuring out how we'd get through that pandemic. So the ZTA is being introduced now. What it would do is it would clarify that master plan bikeways located in the Clarksburg East and West overlay zones are exempt from impervious surface restrictions. Um, there is a planning board recommendation as well as a staff report in your packet. In addition, there is a letter in opposition from the county executive and DEP in the packet as well. And that'll have public hearing in mid-January. Thank you very much, Ms. Nadu. We will have that public hearing and uh, this has been introduced. So thank you very much. And we are running ahead of schedule, which is great. Like efficient meetings. So uh, next up is legisl legislative session day 35. Um, and a call for bills for final reading. Um, first up or the is expedited bill 3422, streets and roads classification of roads. And this was introduced by lead sponsor, Council Member Albernaz, serving as the council president. Uh, and this is to correct some errors regarding uh, previous legislation regarding town centers and new safety road designs. And I see Dr. Orlin is here to fill us in a little bit more. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Um, Ms. Wellens is out sick today, so Ms. Nadu is here back up back her up so we wish her well and jason sartori here chief of uh, countywide planning um, after the complete streets bill was approved by the last council back in earlier this fall which is a very complex very detailed bill uh, all the staffs including dot staff found there were some errors in the list of what's called town centers in the bill and so this really just corrects that it adds like four uh, town centers uh, uh, that should have been in the original bill and all the other changes you see in here are just uh, corrections to the names so it, it links up directly with um, geography which exists already in the law so uh, it's really as simple as that uh, we had the public hearing last week there were no speakers uh, and asked for your approval and I'll just fill in for for all of our colleagues uh, that this legislation was to recognize that not all communities and not all roads are the same in Montgomery County so we've classified them in an effort to make them safer for all users and that's essentially what this legislation is aimed at uh, fine-tuning um, so not hearing any comments I'll turn it over to our clerk for a roll call vote uh, I'm sorry I'm uh, uh, Mr. Sartori, Mr. Sartori uh, uh, apologize um, okay. the bill that was introduced had several changes since then, we found a few more changes to the names, not, not additional areas, which are included in this version of the bill. Right. So again, nothing substantive, but it's, it's more technical changes. Glad we caught the technical changes. Thank, Thank you. you all very much. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Lukey. Yes. 
Councilmember. Sorry, I'm, apologies to the clerk. Um, you need to do a motion since this did not go to committee. There you go. Is there a motion to move this? I'll, I'll move. Uh, so Mr. moved Perfect. by Councilmember Ludke. Second. Is there a second? Councilmember Albernaz. There we go. Thank you. Councilmember Ludke. Yes. Councilmember Ludke votes yes. Councilmember Mink. Councilmember Mink votes yes. yes. Councilmember Sales. Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernoz. Yes. Councilmember Albernoz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando. Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz. Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart. Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom. Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friedson. Yes. Councilmember Friedson votes yes. Councilmember Glass. Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. Thank you all very much. Next item is action for the appointments to the Board of Appeals. Uh, we had a number of individuals who, a number of individuals who uh, wanted to serve on the Board of Appeals, and uh, this council would like to thank everybody uh, who expressed their interest uh, and will continue to stay involved. Um, and uh, it is the determination of this council to move forward the nominations of Mr. Richard Melnick for the non-democratic position and Mr. Alan Sternstein for the Democratic position. Um, can I get a motion? Move to approve. So moved by Councilmember Second. Ludke, seconded by Councilmember Sales. All those in favor of the two appointments, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. And now we're going to move to the consent calendar. May I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved, so moved by Councilmember Albernaz. Second. Seconded by Councilmember Jawando. All those in favor of the consent calendar? That is unanimous. Okay. Well, everybody, we are now at the end of the last session for the calendar year 2022. Don't we have the uh, resolution to approve the executive regulation? No, that's been moved into the consent calendar. Um, uh, some last minute changes, so thank you. Uh, so as we conclude this last session before going into recess, I just want to express my deep appreciation uh, to council staff for working so tirelessly and vigorously over the last year and particularly over the last number of months as we have prepared for this council, the new and expanded council, getting everybody onboarded, getting their offices ready, them getting their staffs ready. Um, I want to welcome them. I want to welcome their staffs. Um, it has been uh, a wonderful two weeks so far, and I look forward to the collaboration that's going to continue into the new year. And I think it's also poignant that you know the fiscal update that we just received is a path forward and something I know that we are all going to be mindful of uh, being good fiscal stewards of our residents, making sure that everybody is healthy and safe and housed. Um, and ultimately, this is the work that we're here to do, and we're here to do it together. So my deep appreciation to you, to our staff, and to all the residents, and wishing everybody happy holidays. And with that, we're adjourned.